Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Juranek and I'm founder and CEO of Startup Disrupt. And it's my pleasure to welcome you at this amazing online conference from the Funding Leaders series. And what is going on actually in a Startup Disrupt? So Startup Disrupt is about disrupting old ways of thinking and looking for new ways, new ideas and new angles, how actually, you know, uh, create new solutions which can uh, improve the world around us. And we want to unleash the power of innovators. And with those power and this potential, we would like to improve the world all around us without any borders. And especially the, you know, the topic of changes, that the change, changes are natural and welcome. And without them, there couldn't be any, any improvements around us. So uh, we are a digital innovation hub, which is trying to inspire, educate and connect entrepreneurs, technology innovators, and start up with their investors, business partners, corporates, SMEs, and with anyone who is able to support them on this journey. And it wouldn't be possible for us to organize events like this without support of our partners and sponsors like Check Invest, US Embassy, uh, Alex UI, Microsoft for Startups, uh, FFK, and uh, Napa Troku and others. It is our great honor to host today former CIA director, U former U.S. Army general and partner at KKR, General David H. Petrus. Farsai Chat will be moderated by Vid Horky, who is a founder of Brand Embassy and Angel Investor. So have your seat and today's event funding leaders from CIA to startup investments is starting now. General David Petrius, hello. How are you? Good. Thanks, Eve. And thanks, uh, Patrick, for the invitation. It's great to be with Startup Disrupt. Thank you for, for having us today. Um, and thank you for all of you joining the today's stream on, on YouTube. Um, today, we are going to be talking about startups and business angel investing. Um, but which is kind of weird because most of the interviews um, I watched with you um, were about invading Iraq or getting out of Afghanistan or the latest and greatest of the CIA covert operations. So I'm sure this will be very, very interesting and unique opportunity to talk with you about startup ecosystem, investing into startups and what it is like for for a person with your experience and skills to get into the world of of young people trying to change the world. So thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, My privilege. Now, um, only reading highlights of your CV can easily take us like 10, 15 minutes. So I took the liberty of making highlights of those highlights for for the audience. Um, so I'll just go uh, very quickly through that. Uh, you graduated with distinction from the U.S. Military Academy, subsequently earned a PhD from Princeton University. You have received a number of medals, honorary degrees, and you were decorated by 13 foreign countries, including Czech Republic. Uh, I don't know if you know that. Uh, this is a big thing, by the way. I'm Czech, and I know very well that we are a nation that is very hard to please. We're generally complaining about everything. So getting a, you know, anything from us is kind of a you know, big thing. So congratulations again. Thank you very much. Um, you have served 37 years in U.S. military, including tours in Cold War Europe, uh, Central America, Haiti, Bosnia, Kuwait, Iraq, and Afghanistan. You led combat com campaigns in Baghdad, Iraq, and many other places. And you have served as the director of the CIA and led their many counterterrorism efforts. In 2013, you became a partner at KKR, a global, a global private equity firm, and chairman of the KKR Global Institute, a think tank. Um, by the way, when I was leading my last startup, Brent Embassy, um, I made a lucky partnership with KKR as we were helping the newly acquired companies to transform 
their customer service very quickly. And I profited personally very much by having very tasty coffees on one of the top floors of one of the nicest skyscraper buildings in Manhattan, New York. So thank you for that, actually. That's a pleasure. That's where my office was. We've actually moved from there over to the newest, biggest real estate development in all of America called Hudson Yards, uh, but an equally wonderful place. I think our 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 suite is listed as 7,500, which gives you an idea of how many floors there are. Uh, we have the top 10 floors. I'm sure. And uh, recently you made over 20 startup investments across public safety software, AI for autonomous cars or harassment prevention training software. Uh, what, I, what I found very interesting, you have co-invested with some very interesting people out there like uh, Ehud Barak, the former Israeli prime minister, or, or Kevin Duran, uh, one of the MBI all-star players of Brooklyn Nets. Um, so that, that's very interesting. John Doerr as well, actually, who's, I think, regarded as certainly one of the very best American venture capitalists ever. And uh, he and I are one of, we're, we're two of the only three series, uh, seed A and B series investors in a firm called ASAP, which is a an artificial intelligence firm company that probably uh, looks to be a pretty sure thing is going to be a unicorn if it's not already. Very interesting. Now... As a starter, well, let's start with something fairly easy. Do you sleep better after the new uh, U.S. president of the United States, Joe Biden, who was sworn in into the office earlier this month? Well, we've obviously had a lot of drama uh, over the last uh, few months alone, certainly to some degree over the last four years. Um, I know the new president. He was the vice president when I was a four-star general, two different positions, and CIA director. In fact, he swore me in. Uh, I know the team uh, that he has assembled around him, the National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, Defense. He worked for me three times. Um, and again, it's a very, very high-quality team. Uh, the nominee for director of the CIA, again, is a, is a personal friend as well as a professional colleague. So, um, yeah, I think that, again, there's a Uh, the volume has literally just gone down because, of course, there's one less person on Twitter right now. Uh, and again, the focus is a bit less on sort of disruption, which has its purposes, by the way. Don't take that as a, an indictment. Uh, as, as founders of startups know better than anyone else, what you're trying to do is disrupt markets, disrupt sectors, Um, and change things, uh, move fast, uh, and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think the it's certainly quieter uh, right now. We live just across the river from Washington, D.C., uh, and the, the tension that we saw in the wake of the election, in the wake of the assault on the U.S. Capitol, the home of our Congress, and so forth, um, all of that has been reduced quite considerably. I can believe that. Now, for the audience connecting today on YouTube, just a reminder, um, you can send your own questions uh, to Slido, uh, which is slide.do um, slash SDP, as Startup Disrupt. So feel free to ask any questions. This is an event, after all, for you. Now, we have divided our discussion into three blocks. Uh, we're going to be talking first about investing into startups, Then we are going to be talking about the 21st century grand challenges and the role of the startups in them. And lastly, we will cover the topic um, of startups in the wider ecosystem. Um, now, let's get to the very first block. Um, you, you, you spent tens of hours um, with the President George W. Bush or Barack Obama, often behind closed doors. Have you ever talked about startups? No, not directly with him. Of course, I was doing that in, as a general officer or as a director of the CIA. Uh, but certainly, uh, startups were supported by the United States government uh, in each of those administrations and also by the Trump administration as well. There's long been enormous support Uh, for the entrepreneurship, the innovation, uh, these individuals that build a company, that is really what has kept America's economy at the forefront of the world for 
uh, centuries, actually, and certainly we've seen that very dramatically uh, in recent decades. Uh, if you think about, as an example, the four great revolutions that I think we're seeing around the world today, the IT revolution, obviously an awful lot of that has come out of Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley in New York or Silicon Hills in Austin, you name it. Uh, if you look at the uh, energy revolution, that's really all about uh, hydraulic fracturing of for oil and natural gas that was invented in the United States, implemented in the United States, and really only in the United States, and completely revolutionized energy markets. Uh, if you look at advanced manufacturing, certainly there's a good bit of that elsewhere in the world, including in Europe, also obviously in, in Asia. Uh, but again, the U.S. has had a very prominent role uh, in the rise of the robot, the increasing uh, automation of everything that is that used to take place with individuals on an assembly line now takes place increasingly uh, with robots and machines on assembly line and with the people maintaining them and making sure the materials uh, are always replenished. Uh, and then the final one, life sciences, again, a lot of that around the world, but certainly a huge contribution from the United States. And we see that most recently with the advent of the vaccines. Uh, one of them here, another one invented essentially a consortium of countries, uh, US, UK, and Germany. So uh, again, I think that that element of the US economy has long been very, very significant. It's not to say that there's not enormous entrepreneurship going on around the world, uh, certainly uh, in various countries and locations in Europe, there are different critical masses of, of startups and so forth. Again, the UK, I've done this kind of thing in Amsterdam and Germany and elsewhere. Uh, certainly Israel, where I spend a fair amount of time, and I think three or four of the 20 startups in which I invested over the last uh, seven years uh, are in Israel. Uh, and then obviously the rise of China and the rise of Asia, Asia writ large, the, the, the title of a recent book, The Future is Asia, uh, captures also the extraordinary real explosion, not just of economic growth, but also, again, of innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, and so forth. And when you look at what Jack Ma has done, uh, look at Xiaomi, look at Tencent, you name it, they are very, very impressive. And those are extraordinary strategic leaders as well that, that are leading that. And I'll come back to this theme again and again because when I'm looking at a startup, when I'm evaluating the prospects, there are really two huge categories that I'm assessing. The first is the quality of the leadership. And keep in mind that even as a young founder with just a few people that, you know, everyone in the entire firm can fit around one conference room table, that founder is a strategic leader. In other words, the leader of an organization such as I was during the surge in Iraq with 165,000 American men and women alone, plus tens of thousands of coalition, including from the Czech Republic, I might add. Uh, but a strategic leader has four tasks that he or she has to get right. Got to get the big ideas right. That's that original big idea. Have to communicate them through the breadth and depth of the organization and also out and, and to clients, customers, uh, other stakeholders. You have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. That's what we normally think of as leadership. And then you have to have the agility and the uh, the structure intellectually to formally sit down and determine how to refine the big ideas and do it again and again and again. If you look at the great companies today that began, as always, as startups. So you look at what Jeff Bezos did, starting delivering books and boxes from his garage and now what is built in Amazon. Uh, look at what Reed Hastings has done at Netflix, a true extraordinary company, a true extraordinary leadership leader. Here we see individuals who kind have of repeatedly gotten the ideas right and have demonstrated the ability to continue the organization at the scale. Well known, for example, that Steve Jobs had to step aside from leadership for, for a period of time because, again, there were some attributes, qualities, and so forth that needed further development uh, before he could indeed come back and take the company forward, rescue it in a sense. Uh, one more time. Uh, the other question, the other issue that I'm, I'm looking at, of course, is the big idea uh, and how powerful is it, uh, that test that you always apply if you, you know, the, the old saying that if you want to be a billionaire, invent something that a billion people want to buy. So what is the potential market size? 
what are the competitors in the space? Uh, what is the first mover advantage if there is one? What are the barriers to entry for others trying to, uh, to copy what this startup has done, et cetera, et cetera? You know, what's the big idea's value and the quality and how impressive is it? Uh, and can it develop additional use cases is off, also often another question uh, that you ask, particularly when you're talking about uh, initiatives and in fields like artificial intelligence, mach machine learning, and some of these other areas of so-called revolution. So uh, that's what I always look for. Uh, and actually, you look for those same strategic leadership qualities, again, whether it's a founder, as I said, of a very small startup. Uh, or the commander of the surge in Iraq or Afghanistan or U.S. Central Command, where we actually had 250,000 American men and women in uniform. Those four tasks of that strategic leader are common uh, to whomever it is that is actually the leader or co-leader of an organization. Mm -hmm. And when did you first learn about startups and investing about startups? Was it Great after question. after you finished your military and CIA career or was it during? It was actually when I was the CIA director. Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, I knew about startups. You read about them. You see the rise of Amazon, of these IT, of Google, of uh, Facebook and all the rest of that. But I really didn't understand, in a sense, the ecosystem of a startup. What is it like? How does it you know, how does it actually start? I mean, does somebody just sort of lock the door and pull the blinds and code for 48 hours as somebody slides pizza under the door? How does it all work? So when I was the director of the CIA, uh, we had, we provided, this is all publicly known, uh, the CIA actually provides funds to an organization called Incutel, which is a nonprofit, independent uh venture capital firm that, in a sense, works to provide answers to challenges or problems that the CIA is encountering, and now does it actually for the entire U.S. intelligence community and also for some of our uh, closest allies around the world. And it actually has facilities now no longer just in Arlington, Virginia, here near the CIA, uh, but also out in Silicon Valley. We stood that one up when I was the director, and now there are also some in some overseas capitals as well. Uh, and so I asked the head of uh, Incutel, who rightly earned something like six times what I did on my government salary and, and earned it. Uh, they'd had a very, very successful, and they continue to be incredibly successful. They were the first million-dollar investment in Palantir, as an example, back in the very early days. And I asked him, you know, could is there somebody in one of the firms in which you have invested who could explain to me and sort of mentor me on what a startup is? And so, in fact, he asked the CEO of Palantir, the founder and CEO, um, and uh, Alex Karp became my mentor and explained to me, you know, this is how it starts. This is how it grows. This is what you do along the way. These are the different rounds of investing. Um, this is what you're seeking to do as you move along. Uh, and ultimately, when I left the CIA, he actually wanted to hire me uh, to advise him actually on strategic leadership and some other issues. I couldn't do that because of my role with, uh, with KKR, although I've uh, provided advice from time to time uh, because he's a good friend and an incredibly successful entrepreneur. As you know, that was one of the big IPOs of this past year. So he really educated me on that. Uh, it was a great privilege to learn from someone who had been and still is such a successful founder uh, and now a leader of a very, very substantial firm. I forget the valuation now, but it is tens of billions uh, at the least. And, and again, provides very valuable services to everything from the financial community to uh, intelligence services in the Western world. Interesting. Um, I'm going to take the first question from the audience, uh, from Ben, who is actually asking about InQtel and what an individual investor or venture capital firm can actually learn from the strategy of InQtel, uh, where to find interesting investment opportunities and how to grab that opportunity and turn it into something big? Well, InQtel has an advantage uh, in a sense because any investment that it makes is typically followed, but almost $15 for every $1 that InQtel invests will follow immediately because 
when InQtel invests in a company, it is well known that there is at least one very good customer for that company's product. And that would obviously be uh, the CIA or now one of the other elements of the intelligence community or multiple ones, and now also perhaps other intelligence services around the world. And all of this is obviously publicly known. So venture capital firms watch very carefully to see when InQtel is investing. And as I said, it's very quick. In many cases, they, they will follow InQtel's lead because, again, that's an indication that, that this is not just a, an investment with promise. It means that this is an investment that is going to have revenue very quickly, and it's going to likely be government revenue, which often is a pretty sticky revenue, if you will. Uh, when uh, InQtel invests, that's a sign of approval from some customer in the intelligence community. Uh, and generally, those customers do a lot of diligence before they give the thumbs up for the product, uh, which is, of course, in, and then will obviously start the revenue stream for that company right away. So it's a different model, obviously, than any other one. On the other hand, uh, I believe it is by law that it has to look at every investment that is brought to it. So they also go through an extraordinary amount. I think it's literally a thousand or so startups that they end up evaluating in a given year. Now, obviously, they don't do complete diligence on every single one of those. Uh, there's a triage process, if you will, and a winnowing out to get to those in which they do the serious uh, analysis and review and, and, and complete the diligence and then even fewer that, of course, in which they invest. But they have a very, very strong pipeline because everybody wants to get their product in front of InQtel, uh, hoping that, again, some government agency uh, will find real value in this and that it will help launch it. And then again, as I said, lead to interest from other investors as well. Your role I, at... You know, if I could add, I, it's in that sense, it's not unlike the really universally admired uh, venture investors, again, the John Doors of the world, or um, you know the Andreessen Horowitz, you know the the really big uh, venture capital firms, which have had a hugely successful uh, rate, uh, and I think an awful lot watch to see who is leading the round of investment, uh, and then once they have the stamp of approval from one of the very significant firms. Uh, an awful lot of others will follow in part because of that. And you have the same phenomenon with InQtel. Understood. Now, your role at KKR is mostly about identifying and supporting investments into mostly already established companies with tens of millions or hundreds of millions in, in revenue or valuations. But Besides that, you are a business angel investor and you have invested many times your seed rounds or series A rounds uh, to much younger companies. Now, can you tell us about some of your recent investments and why did you invest? Uh, why did you invest it? What made you to decide when, frankly, it, yeah, I took you know, notes from the four points that you were discussing about strategy and strategic decision making. But at the very beginning of building a startup, it's way more messy, right? So it's very difficult to recognize, is this the next billion dollar idea or not? Well, um, again, I need to disassociate um, my private venture capital investments, all of which are approved by KKR's compliance need to say to make sure there's no conflicts or anything else like that, and there are certain agreements that you make should KKR ever be interested in it later on. Uh, but, but KKR does every type of conceivable investing that you might imagine. It's not just the traditional private equity anymore. And again, as you noted, this is big investing. Again, you can't deploy hundreds of billions of dollars in small increments. So these are we're looking for very, very large investments. And again, not just private equity, but now also the real assets of real estate energy infrastructure there. We do do growth capital uh, investing, which is sort of the later stage uh, of venture. But the, the threshold at which we'll consider a company has to be 25 million of annual recurring revenue, roughly or thereabouts, unless it's really uh, moving on a very rapid upward trajectory in the in the projection is that it's going to be well above that very quickly. 
Uh, and in those cases, we will do the smaller investments. There are some other categories in which we do that as well to a degree. Uh, our impact investing fund is another category, but we're also in credit capital markets and we origin our, originate our own debt as well. My role in the firm uh, is to do the geopolitical risk analysis for investments around the world and to integrate the macroeconomic analysis the environmental, social, and governance issues analysis so that we bring all those together. There are three of us that had these different uh, elements. And then we put that together with the team from the respective industry group and part of the world uh, that is taking a particular investment, has done diligence, and will take it to the investment committees, again, for that industry and or uh, part of the world, usually breaking it down into the Americas, Asia, uh, and, and Europe, Mideast, and Africa. Um, when it comes to the startup investments, again, these are individual. Uh, people come to me. Uh, they perhaps want me to be on the board or to help them in some way or something. I'm not allowed to do that, but I can, again, as I said, with compliance approval, uh, invest in them. And when you look at the recent investments, they're very much in line with what I just laid out. They typically have very, very impressive strategic leaders, i.e. their founder and CEO. Typically, it's still one and the same uh, because, of course, I, I think that you want to find the founder who's going to be able to scale the company. If you have a founder who is just a complete, say, technical person, period, um, you could have a challenge if that person may not have the ability to scale it as the CEO but still wants to be the CEO. So you're looking for a degree of uh, self-awareness, frankly, uh, as well in, in, in founders. But you're evaluating the founder and you're evaluating the big idea. One of the recent ones that we just did was Zipline. Uh, this is a brilliant uh, young founder. Um, I think he was Harvard. He might have been a Rhodes Scholar. But again, it's that quality uh, of mine. Um, and he had invented a drone delivery company that pioneered its activities in a couple of countries in Africa, delivering medicine to far-flung uh, medical uh, elements that can't be reached easily at all times of the year uh, over the road. No airports are nearby, and it can drop it, it delivers it, and then flies. It's a fixed wing, uh, electric uh, with batteries and, and so forth. So. A very, very impressive company. I've known him actually for a number of years. Um, he's scaling very rapidly, uh, some very big developments now in the U.S., which, of course, is the market at the end of the day that uh, one has to penetrate. It's interesting in that regard, by the way, that startups in smaller countries in Europe, frankly, uh, also in Israel, uh, again, if they want to make it eventually, if they want to take it beyond the point of just selling it at, say, the, I don't know, $100 million dollar uh, valuation or something like that, they generally end up coming to the United States and displacing their their leadership there as well. Um, another one, uh, Carbine is a recent one, C-R-B-Y-N-E. This is a very, very sharp, it's an Israeli founder who moved to the United States. It basically takes information from 911 emergency services calls and it can bring in, incorporate all kinds of additional information um, from other data sets simultaneously with that call, some of which it gets from the, uh, the metadata associated with the call itself, some of which it gets from other data sources, so that the 911 operator is not just listening to a call. Now uh, he or she actually has a variety of other bits of information that can be very, very important uh, to the ultimate success of that uh, emergency service that is provided. It's hugely uh, impressive in that regard. Um, there's one actually, again, you know, how else do we know startups? Well, both our daughter and our daughter-in-law uh, have founded startups. Our son-in-law is employed with a startup. It's quite a mature one in the IT space. He's a systems integrator. Uh, but our daughter-in-law, who's, again, a, a Harvard and Rhodes Scholar and also served in Afghanistan with an airborne brigade, uh, founded a startup that focuses on uh, the kinds of corporate learning uh, that are required in New York, California, Illinois, and a variety of other states uh, for topics such as uh, sexual harassment, uh, anti-money laundering, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, et cetera, et cetera. And frankly, I've gone through this training. It is required, um, and it generally is, is not particularly impressive or innovative 
and it's of questionable, of arguable uh, effectiveness as a result. You tend to race through it. You hit the hit the return key as quickly as you possibly can uh, and get through it, as opposed to what is a much more thoughtful, much more engaging, much more bespoke uh, product that she and her co-founders have uh, developed and is scaling very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, again, that's not just because it was the family and friends around that we invested. We invested because we thought we had uh, really great confidence in her as her second startup. Uh, she had a good exit from the first, or a modest exit from the first one. Uh, but she knows that sector. Uh, it, she knows the, that world um, and also worked at McKinsey for a while. So when you put all that together, once again, it comes back to the founder, the leadership team, and the, the quality of the product as always. And that has been the metric I've used for every single one of these, including that one that I said uh, I was a seed Series A and Series B. And if they ever do it again, I will invest further. But they are gaining, generating so much revenue, I'm not sure that they will actually need to do that. Uh, but that gives you the story of all of those. There's no particular you know, key sector on which I've developed you know, very, very deep uh, knowledge, I wouldn't say, or expertise, but I know people who have that expertise. Uh, there are lots and lots of folks in these various ecosystems uh, with whom I have worked and who will bring deals to me, and in some cases, I'll bring deals to them. Mm. So that's what's evolved over the last nearly uh, eight years now uh, that we've been doing this. How how important it is as a, me as a startup founder, uh, you know, where I am. I mean, you have mentioned that uh, you have invested into a company of Israeli founder who moved uh, to United States, but here I am in a COVID times with no real possibility of moving to United States, of growing my business there. Can we just keep zooming until we IPO together? I think that's difficult to do, but it's not impossible um, at all, actually. And I think the post-pandemic world uh, of Zoom has demonstrated that to us. Uh, it may be that Israeli founders don't need to come to the U.S. in the future. And I, by the way, I do believe if you have a great product and you impress people as a great leader, uh, they'll figure out a way to enable you to come to New York or wherever it is. An awful lot of them come and settle in New York or obviously out in the Palo Alto area uh, have attractive locations now and a few locations in the United States to these critical masses of real startup uh, and, and where you have the big incubators that have been built uh, as well by individuals who are successful startup founders themselves and scaled and sold companies and now want to help other people. We had one, actually, we called it Silicon Beach. Uh, I had a chair at the University of Southern California for six years. It was a one week per semester chair. And very early on, I asked if they could, I, I said I wanted to look at the startups that they uh, were incubating at the School of Engineering, the Viterbi School. Um, and so we had a deal where they had, I think it was five minutes they could make their presentation. I had eight minutes to ask questions and then it was gone. And it was so impressive uh, that I said, you know what, we need to do a startup event at least once a year here at the University of Southern California because we should be building what becomes known as Silicon Beach, again, to challenge Silicon Valley in Northern California, uh, Silicon Hills, Silicon Alley, et cetera. Uh, and indeed, that is actually well along. Um, you not you have not only University of Southern California, you obviously have uh, California Tech, Polytechnic Institute, Caltech, you've got UCLA, you have Pepperdine, there's a whole ecosystem of these in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, and there have been now the first IPOs for, for over a billion dollars in down on, on the beach in the various areas where they have these locations. And again, I invested in two of those as well, one of which is already a 2.5x exit. So um, this is a fascinating field for me. I enjoy working with young people. I particularly admire young people who have the courage uh, and the determination to start something um, having been part of a hierarchical organization, you know, where your whole progression is very carefully measured and, and everything is laid out for you to see them do that uh, is hugely impressive. So I have great admiration uh, for you and, and your comrades, V. And look, I think 
you know, you start, you build something there, you can do it certainly within the EU. I mean, that's one of the second biggest market in the world. Um, and having access to that the way that uh, is possible is very, very significant. Um, yes, there certainly are nations within that. Yes, they speak different languages. Yes, there are some challenges associated with that. Uh, it's not obviously the kind of seamless uh, investment space or, or ecosystem, uh, but it is a very attractive one, I think. Um, and again, certainly anything that can come to the United States, which is still, after all, the world's biggest market, uh, with China closing in pretty quickly, needless to say. Uh, but that is a very, very attractive market uh, at the end of the day, and that's where people want to come. I'd also say that, you know, in some of the firms that we have invested in KKR that are strictly U.S. firms, we're also obviously very big in Europe and huge in Asia, uh, but in many cases we're working to get those firms actually a beachhead in the EU um, and we do a lot of work in that regard, as well as obviously in, in those countries in Asia uh, where there are prospects for growth as well. Very good. Some of your investments can make uh, potentially a huge impact on, on society um, concerning existential risks, public safety, etc. Speaking about impact investing, um, uh, uh, Salesforce's CEO Mark Benioff recently claimed that the business of business is improving the state of the world rather than just generating profit only. How does it sound to you? Is is profit the only measure of startup success for you? No. Um, in fact, I'd offer as an example that KKR actually has an impact fund. Um, and I describe it this way. Uh, norm in normal times, always, KKR has sought to do well, in other words, to have a very successful financial investment, obviously, to help a firm in which we invest or which we own, help it grow, ultimately uh, sell it, take it public, uh, have an exit, and certainly return a lot more money to our investors and to ourselves than uh, we put into it in, in the first place. That's doing well. But we have also added on to that for decades, really from the beginning, do well while doing good. Um, so you don't want to uh, do well while breaking the law or fouling the environment or doing something else, uh, promoting corrupt practices or something like that. With our impact fund, we've actually reversed that. We're actually saying that we want to do good. That's the intent. And the measurement of good, the metrics are all tied to the Millennium Challenge Goals of the United Nations. So they're all publicly well-known And, and actually quite clearly described and, and can be measured. Uh, we want to do good while still doing well. We still obviously want to make money for our investors and, and for the firm. Uh, but again, the, the primary emphasis is to, to do good. Um, I think you can do both. Um, and I think you have to do both because if you don't do both, uh, your ability to do good is going to be limited uh, more than if you can do good and also still do well. Uh, and of course, Mark is speaking from a platform, if you will, or a foundation of having done incredibly well and still doing very, very well with one of the great startups of all times and others. Um, and, and again, one of the really respected investors uh, also. But those have done really, again, enormous, provided enormous benefits for those who have used the Uh, the products and the services that he and his comrades have have invented and then scaled. And so, there are a number that I mean, one of the another one of the ones in which I'm invested is a um, a young Stanford graduate student and other graduate students um, who he was, I think, the number one or number two on the civil service exam in all of India. This enormous test uh, or engineering exam. And he founded a firm that uses all of the data that is available uh, on uh, the, uh, the Earth, the Earth's surface, uh, various features in it. Um, so it's a lot of geographic uh, data and geodesic data. And then also information on the building architecture uh, and all the rest of this and infrastructure, critical infrastructure. And the idea was that when you have a natural disaster, let's say on the West Coast where there's some earthquake-prone areas, 
uh, or uh, say major floods, you name it. You can model all of this if you are an extraordinary, have extraordinary capability with data analytics, and that's what their their strength is. Uh, and the idea is that when you have a disaster, uh, and the nine one one call operators are you know under siege by calls. This firm tells them where they need to respond. It, in a sense, it does a data to help you triage that you should go here first because that's the most important, that's the hardest hit, that's the most vulnerable, depending on the metrics that you assign to the case. And actually, there are just endless use cases from that. That means that you can also then tell an insurance company that if you want to reduce your risk, and therefore, ideally, the premiums for those who are paying for your services, um, they can make marginal improvements in these areas and, again, reduce the risk in the event of an earthquake, uh, a major flood, other disaster, tsunami, uh, and so forth. In fact, countries which have had tsunamis have uh, signed on with them. I, I just think the idea of that is just enormously appealing. That, that is doing really, real good for the world uh, in its most vulnerable moments, um, and yet, we think it can also uh, do well. Another one, uh, police software system. These were Harvard uh, undergrads who spent their summer vacations on patrols with Los Angeles Police Department to understand the software plat they, platform they had, which required incredible amounts of input. Uh, and they actually created a platform that's it's, it's open architecture. It's it's, it's one that can be changed very easily without having to bolt stuff on and the difficulties that come with that. Um, and it has reduced the amount of time, for example, that the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. was spending uh, over 60 percent less time just putting data into systems with uh, poor uh, devices. And so it's a huge benefit uh, to police forces at that time is out on the streets rather than um, at a device, uh, cumbersome device, trying to put data into it. And then it, it's a file service and storage and, and uh, software retrieval also merges other data from lots of other data sets uh, in a place like Washington. Needless to say, there are numerous ones that all have to be combined. So uh, again, that's a hugely valuable service. Uh, and it is just exploding as police departments uh, identify uh, the gains that can be made by employee then. And again, it's interesting that, again, Harvard students would be attracted to do something for uh, first responders and law enforcement that way, which I also found very impressive. So uh, again, those are just a few of the examples. But as you can obviously see, I can get pretty excited about that stuff. And frankly, when the founder of Mark 43 came to see me the very first time, I'd given him 15 minutes on the calendar. We had another 15 minutes in case it went a bit longer so I could, but I could get rid of him in 15 minutes if I wasn't interested. So we stayed for 30 minutes. Then I canceled the next appointment. Then I canceled everything until that event. I had to do a speech that night, but I'd still be talking to him, I think, if I hadn't had something on the <laughs> calendar that forced me to end that meeting. And it's been a wonderful relationship ever since. You said something very particularly interesting for me, and that was that the traditional fund of KKR is um, mostly interested in profit, of course, and then the impact fund is mostly interested in in the impact. With you know, of course, if profit comes, well, it's, it's great. And I want to yeah, ask you actually that about that that you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned that profit and impact on be of equal importance for the startup. Now, have you ever led a military mission that had two goals of the same importance in mind? Um, you typically have a main effort, but you also have supporting efforts. Um, you know, there's not a single-minded, There, you might have a single-minded purpose in some respect, but there are other uh, aspirations and other goals that are also, in many cases, enabled by what you do. To think about, for example, the comprehensive civil-military counterinsurgency campaign that Ambassador Crocker and I pursued in Iraq during the surge, which drove violence down by 85 percent, that was a huge accomplishment by our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and again, including some very fine Czech soldiers. Um, but that was to establish a foundation. So you're, you're improving security for the people uh, because then the people are going to support 
the new Iraq rather than continue to oppose it. Uh, and then that makes possible other activities. Now, all of a sudden, you can repair the damaged infrastructure, uh, rebuild the bridge that was blown up, pave the road, and that allows resumption of the marketplace uh, that reopens. And then they give you a bit more intelligence to help you with your security operations. That takes more bad guys off the street. Now, all of a sudden, you can get the electrical tower back up right and get the wires with electricity running through them no longer blown up. And, you know, one leads to another. Um, and so, again, I, I, you have a single-minded purpose, but it's not purely, you know, you don't improve security just for security, as important and, and as vital as that is. And without it, you have no foundation on which to build. But again, you're, you're reestablishing that because it then enables other objectives. And it's the other objectives that actually reinforce, that solidify uh, the security gains and enable you to make more. So I, I wouldn't um, simplify the operations to the point, yes, we just want to take you know, Hill 734, uh, there's a reason why you're taking Hill 734. There's a supporting effort taking the other hill over there to keep them from hitting you in that direction. Again, it's much more complex uh, than it might seem sometimes uh, in, in the movies. I bet. Uh, <laughs> and now, um, we're facing many existential risks, you, me, and everybody involved. Um, out there, including, for example, are uh, the risks associated with artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and I would say uh, that even des misinformation and fake news are, sure. you know, very much um, helping to someone and not helping to to everyone else. Um, do you see this as a business opportunity when you look at it as a as an angel investor or private equity investor? You know, I must confess that I see it as a, you know, if you want to talk, for example, about uh, hate speech, um, disinformation, uh, false news, uh, incitement to violence, all of which have been enabled on an industrial strength scale by social media, internet service platforms, etc., um, I see those first and foremost, frankly, as challenges to the social fabric of our countries, uh, of challenges to our democratic systems, uh, because again, keep in mind that democracy, the foundation of democracy is informed citizens, not misled citizens or enraged citizens or um, citizens whose grievances have been so amplified that they now act uh, in, in extremist fashion, which is, in a sense, what did happen, uh, what culminated uh, in the assault on the U.S. Capitol building, uh, the home of our Congress. Um, and again, you can see how that evolved over the years, then over the months, then over the, the weeks and days leading up to it. Uh, and these issues uh, were what ultimately prompted uh, rational individuals uh, to take what clearly, with hindsight, was quite irrational action. Um, you know, there are a number of individuals who have who participated in it, who have now drawn back and said, "My God, what was I thinking?" Uh, including one individual who actually won a gold medal as an Olympic swimmer uh, who participated in this, and again, who descended into these social media echo chambers and was pulled down and sucked into them to the point that, uh, again, he carried out an activity that he now looks back on and has, you know, had conversations with his coach, all made public, obviously, in which, you know, he's wondering, what in the world was I thinking? And so I see those first and foremost as that kind of challenge. Now, having said that, um, I could see where there could be plenty of opportunities, and there are. I mean, again, um, Facebook, um, the various internet service providers, Google, uh, Twitter, Instagram, of course, is part of Facebook. All of these firms have either bought startups uh, that would enable them to do this or created, in a sense, incubated their own startup to try to come to grips with these various issues. Uh, Facebook has 
one of the more developed ones. It has essentially, you know, it's been jokingly referred to as the Supreme Court of social media. Uh, but it's basically an independent entity that works for Facebook and it adjudicates, it argues over whether certain posts should be allowed, whether certain individuals should be banned from Facebook and, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> of course, Germany has a, uh, a social media element that I believe is government uh, 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 operated, if you will, and overseen rather than private enterprise and is one that we all need to look at, we think, here in the United States. <clears throat> but clearly this is a new and very uh, significant and, and increasingly uh, dire challenge facing any democratic countries that on the one hand want to promote and allow and are proud of free speech, <clears throat> freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of the press, um, but are now very, very concerned about what has been happening uh, in these social media echo chambers, what has been happening with um, essentially, again, just incorrect facts being or incorrect information, disinformation, misinformation that has been spread, sometimes, of course, aided and abetted uh, by sovereign countries, such as in the case of Russia's involvement uh, in the 2016 election uh, that incited greater differences and did try to put a finger on the scales of that election, did support one of those candidates, although it's never been been proved, and it can't be proved, uh, that it was the decisive element in the victory of the presidents in, in 2016, but it certainly had an effect. Speaking of the role of a government in the startup environment, um You have mentioned the state, essentially state-funded, CIA-funded, non-profit venture capital firm of Inqtel that was directly that has been directly investing into startups. Um, what do you believe should be the role of governments in the startup ecosystem? Should they invest directly? Should they um, uh, drive investments through their venture capital arms? Should they co-invest with other venture, venture capital firms or should they just stay away and make sure that startups can do whatever they like? I think it's all of the above in various degrees in various sectors. Uh, and it's even more than that because it also should promote, for example, uh, education in STEM. As is well known, the United States is not producing enough science, technology, engineering and math uh, majors and graduate degree holders. So we're bringing them in from outside the world. Immigration, actually, uh, we, I believe, should double the H-1B visas. These are the smart people visas. There's some other categories, uh, the global talent visas and so forth. I mean, I think I've gone so much as to publicly say that, you know, if somebody can get accepted at MIT or Princeton, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, any of the great uni research universities, Uh, from outside, uh, that we should staple a green card to the acceptance letter. Uh, we should want them not only to come and be educated here, we should try to keep them here. Um, so that is yet another facet of it. The government should support uh, critical uh, technologies where there is a clear need for additional investment. We're doing that right now uh, in various uh, technology areas. We've always had the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. We have IARPA, which is the intelligence community's version of that. Uh, we have InQtel. We should have an InQtel-like entity in the Department of Defense, and I've proposed that as well. It requires legislation. Right now, they just give away money, uh, huge sums of money, and support various projects and tests and competitions. My view is you should take a stake in it. There's something special about that. And then, by the way, you actually earn money if you do it well, And you can, as InQtel does, pay your CEO six times what the director of the CIA gets uh, and keep really, really good people uh, on the staff of that organization, which is what they have been able to attract over the year. And by the way, it's people who come not just for the money, because they probably could still make a little bit more out in Silicon Valley, uh, but they come because they're also invested in doing something good for our country and for our intelligence community. So I think it's literally all of the above. Um, and if you look at the initiatives of recent administrations, including the last one, also the Obama administration and the Bush administration, there were lots of initiatives in lots of different ways. There were efforts on the university front to 
uh, tie together different university centers of excellence on a variety of different uh, fields and initiatives, AI and machine learning being among them, um, different types of engineering, uh, IT. Uh, there are direct grants to universities of very substantial amount. Um, although, frankly, our investment in that regard has been flat uh, in real ter in uh, nominal terms, which means that it's gone down slightly in real terms. And I think that's going to be one of the areas of em emphasis uh, by the new administration, as will infrastructure in general. And, you know, just the sheer infrastructure investments that you do can often enable or promote, uh, especially as an example, if it is just fibering up the entire country so that everyone in the country has access to very high speed broadband, which is not the case in many of the rural communities in America. That alone provides huge advantages uh, to everyone uh, who then gets that kind of access. So okay. again, it's very much, you have to have almost always I've found in life, by the way, the answer is a comprehensive approach. It's a whole of government. And in fact, right now I'd say it's a whole of governments with an S on the end, because we should partner with a number of our key allies and partners around the world. And of course, one of the areas that is being stressed by the new administration is to reinvigorate uh, the alliance relationships, the partnerships, and all of these other uh, relationships and multilateral and international organizations uh, that we've been part of over the years and arguably have led in many respects. So you've already seen us rejoin the Climate Accord rejoin the World Health Organization, start to get at, lean towards being active again when it comes to the various bodies that determine standards for various uh, issues and technologies. All of that, I think, is sort of traditional to the United States uh, and is being reemphasized, if you will, now. General, uh, time flies and we're having literally the last three or four minutes and we're we're having a tons of questions from from the audience so i'm gonna pick some and i'll ask you just for a brief answers if you may um a question from patrick a journalist from e15 what business potential or or opportunities are you looking at right now what are the interesting sorts of categories where you believe they're gonna fly in the upcoming years I must say, again, I, I find it hard to identify just one sector. There's an awful lot of, almost all of these are related in some way to big data, to data analytics, to machine learning, AI, um, enabling of uh, different technologies. It, again, it's, it's in a sense, the, it's similar to the automation of jobs that people used to do on assembly lines to being done by machines or robots. Um, you're now seeing tasks that used to be performed by people in the IT space being performed increasingly uh, by machine learning, uh, AI, and, and so forth. And, of course, just the endless um, gathering of data uh, to help machines learn. So you mentioned Helm AI, which is, a, again, a, a firm that is uh, doing a great deal in the space of driverless cars. And of course, the key to a driverless car is that it has to keep on learning to identify what is that object out there. You know, is it a, is it a shadow or is it a person? Um, and, and, and it has to keep getting better and better and better and better. And it has to encounter so, as many possible situations as is possible. So I think it's that kind of firm that is most exciting right now. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a last question from the audience. Uh, by the way, it might be confidential, but don't worry. I'm not going to tell any, everyone. Um, see, um, are, have you ever founded in CIA a startups that were trying to find U UFO? Uh, I, I'm sure that you're going to ask me about Area 51 or whatever it is now, which is, of course, where we have all of the... You tell me. Uh, the the aliens and but of course that's something I just can't discuss on on YouTube I'm afraid now look I not that I recall and a lot of that is obviously all of it is just sheer mythology um, there are unexpected un, uh, unexplained phenomenon that have been reported as is very widely known uh, but you know there's some explanation for them and I doubt that it is um, uh, terrestrial aliens or something like that.
With that, I would like to very much thank you for the discussion today. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you very much to the audience connecting today on YouTube. And I'm sure that we can uh, speak on many hours. It was, it was very much fun. Thank you very much for the time. And I'm looking forward to speak sometime in the future, hopefully again. No, I thank you again, uh, Viet, and also uh, Patrick and Startup Disrupt. And best of luck to everyone there who's trying to be a truly successful strategic leader to perform those four tasks uh, that I described uh, and to find something that a billion people want to buy. What's so bad about that? That's great. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I, I get up, oh, no, no, can't deny it. Oh.